see how long it takes. Okay. So today our presenter will be Rob Howard and he will be presenting on to be or not to be reworking English for the workplace. And after the presentation, if you would like to keep talking, there are social rooms available. So please start, Mr. Howard. Well, thank you very much, and I uh, appreciate the introduction, Sarah. You did a fine job, and I will not do Hamlet today, so that's the good news. Um, what I will be talking to you about, though, is to business English or not to business English. So before you all disconnect and say, ah, business English, like everybody usually does, I want you to stop thinking about it as business English. Think about it as English for the workplace. And this is really the future of what we're looking at. But a little bit about me. Um, just to let you know who I am. I've been teaching um, basically for oh, about 20 years. Uh, first in Brazil for about 15, now in Poland almost exclusively online for the past eight or nine years now. And I have my own company, Online Language Center. I also train teachers who are making the transition to business English with BLTI. I'm currently the joint uh, coordinator for the IATFO Business English SIG. And uh, I have EFL Talks. If you're ever looking for some free CPD, check out EFL Talks. We do it 10 minutes at a time, and I do a bunch of other things. So you can check out my site later on and find out more about me. So business English or workplace English, when it's talked about, it's often mentioned it's an umbrella term. And I like to use it's a blanket term, which covers um, so many different aspects of English teaching. For instance, am I teaching English students who are studying business? Am I teaching business students who are studying English? Am I teaching business people who are studying English or business people who are looking to study business skills? And am I working in company or am I working freelance? And there's so much more that can go into this. But it's really come out in to be a, a huge growing industry. And I think most teachers are woefully unprepared for this and need to start upskilling because this is really the future of what students are going to need the most. And this is what we'll talk about. So the first thing you need to decide is with your student, are they studying language or are they studying skills? Because there will be a difference, and sometimes they're doing both. And what we have to do then is evaluate ourselves. Are we working as a teacher or as we working as a coach? Now, there's uh, many different names that we can use. You'll hear teachers, you'll hear trainers, you'll hear tutors, mentors, coaches. Uh, personally, I don't call myself a teacher. My background is business before I started teaching English. And I like to call myself a facilitator of advanced communication skills. And um, feel free to type in the chat. Anybody know what the difference between an English teacher and a facilitator of advanced communication skills is? I'll give you a second. Okay, well, everybody's asleep, so I'll give you the answer. It's basically $100 an hour. So, decide where you're going to be. But let's um, start off, and I want to talk a bit about why are your students studying English. Now, uh, the reality is different all over the world. Sometimes they're doing it because they have to. Sometimes, you know, students study eight years so they can go to Disney. I don't think so. Um, students don't study six to eight years to watch Netflix. Some do. A lot do it to go for further education here at Brown University. 
and to travel overseas and to continue their education. So the necessity is there for a higher level of English. And some do it because they know by speaking English, they're going to make a lot more money in their career. And these are basically the ones that I want to talk about. So what do students think that their future looks like? Now, I have some of my ex-students here from Brazil, and this one thought that her future was in the bag because now that she speaks English, she has every door open to her, and she's right. Um, one of my students has become an analyst for CNN in Brazil, making good money, good job, doing well. Another one of my students that started with me at the age of 14, uh, now at the age of 25, runs uh, 2.6 million reais, which is about, eh, about $8 million company, um, which is um, with gamification. They have um, teams throughout the world now, and she was just written up last year with the Forbes 30 Under 30. So most of them do have a rosy future ahead, but not all. So what does our current student's future look like? I like to think of it as a clean slate. And if any of you are old enough to remember, this is a blackboard. We used to use these in the old days. But... You've probably heard enough about 21st century skills. You've seen this report, I'm sure, in the past. Um, this was the report that was done by the World Economic Forum in 2018, and we're just a few months away from the fruition of this report, which shows some of the growing uh, skills that people will need in the future for work and some of the declining skills that aren't so important. And I don't necessarily agree with all of them, but here they talk about some of the job landscape. Most of the new jobs are going to come in in IT, in management, in data, in technology. And basic jobs are going to decline. Now, You'll hear a lot with the new reports that are coming out. This is from the OECD, Transformative Competencies for 2030. 2030 is the new benchmark that everybody's setting for how the world will change and how we have to adjust with education and everything in economics. So taking a look at this, there are seven basic skills and attributes that are going to be needed for future employees. And these are things that they expect. And you can see here things like management, leadership, communication, transferable and technical competencies. And these are things that will be necessary for students to have in the future to get jobs. Now, each of these seven skills can be broken down into 35 core competencies. And, you know, we're not going to go through all of them, but I'll let you take a quick look at them just to see. A lot of these are business skills. So as you can see, there's a lot like literacy, management, and the like. Now the question we have to ask again, are we working with business students, let's say at the university level, or are we working with existing business professionals? Because we have to handle these differently. For example, if we look at just communication, business professionals should have all these skills and all the other technical skills and transformative skills that were listed of the 35 already. Remember, these people have studied business. 
they've worked in business, they have experience, they wouldn't get to where they are if they didn't have these skills already. So in business English, what we find is a lot of people are out there trying to teach collaborative working, leadership skills, and they don't have any business background, yet they're teaching to somebody who does have background. They just don't have it in English language. So what we're working with when we work with existing business professionals are the writing skills and the speaking and listening skills. Now, we can use the other 33 skills as tools to work within those. So instead of working with a textbook, which really can't relate to them, we can use these other skills and make them relative in the English language. And this is what we should do for professionals. Now, different for students. And we'll get back to that, though. But here we have jobs at risk of automation. And you'll notice that things like salespeople, retail sales, receptionists, clerks, security guards, these are all going away. What's going to probably remain, doctors, lawyers, musicians, singers, and school teachers, elementary, they put here. So this is good news because these are business professionals that are going to need English. But these other jobs that are going away, this kind of scares me. I went to the supermarket yesterday, and they used to have 20 cash registers with somebody there to check you out on um, when you buy your groceries. Now they've knocked it down to about three or four live cashiers, and everything is self-service. What they're doing is they're putting these people out of jobs already. And my question is, if you've taken a job as a cashier, maybe, you know, you're working at university or maybe this is the highest level that you can attain due to your education or whatever, where are these people going to go in the future? And remember, we've got people coming up behind them. So this is what I'm going to worry about. So what does our current student's future look like? And who is the future user? Well, think about it. If we use 2030 as a benchmark, tomorrow's student is today's 13-year-old. So any 13-year-old today in 2030 should be out of university if they've gone and entering the job market. So... These are the students that I'm worried about now, and I think that we need to work with. Now, just to mention it, you hear it a lot. I'm not going to talk more about it, but you see the 21st century skills and the competencies and qualities that everybody feels that we need to have. Yes, we definitely need to have these as adults, and usually in our first language, we have most of these, especially as business people. But I think we need to start working with students now because what we're entering is a different type of work environment, not the same that old people like me who studied in school 100 years ago used to have. So some things that I think students no longer need. Um, when I was in high school, I spent a month trying to memorize Shakespeare. Why? And this is why I had to be or not to be. They had us memorizing soliloquies that I'll never use before, talking in a strange language that I will never use in the future. And nobody, unless they read Shakespeare, would even understand. Why did we waste time with this? Another one, you probably yourself have studied the periodic table of elements. Now, we had to spend months and months memorizing all of these. Um, we had to know the atomic weight. We had to know the abbreviation. We had to know all the classifications. I hate science. I'm not going into science. I never will work with science. 
why did I have to learn all this? All I remember is H2O. Now, I'm going to ask um, a couple of you, if you want, uh, type quickly in the chat room the answer I want to ask you. Let's see what you remember. What's the abbreviation of silicon? Just type quick in the chat room if you could. Hopefully you're awake. Anybody remember? S-O-E. -E. <laughs> Close, Dennis. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. S-I. Very good, Sarah. Sarah, you're studying science. Get out of here. <laughs> Kidding. What's the abbreviation of silver? Nobody knows? Nope, that's nickel. Oh, I remembered that. Um, silver is AG. What's the abbreviation of radiculum? Okay, Sarah's got that look on her face. What? Yeah, it doesn't exist. It's BS. <laughs> I made it up. How about what is antimony? Mercury. Now, antimony is what I pay my ex-wives every month. So, sorry. It's a bit of a joke. But, look, right now, 54% of the information on the Internet is in English. Now, this is not the future, over 50% of technical and scientific periodicals are in English. So what does this say? If you can't read English, if you don't understand English, do you have access to all the information that you need to properly do any technical or scientific job in the future? Now, I mentioned before that I lived in Brazil for 15 years and now in Poland for five. I will not go to a doctor who does not speak English. And the reason for it is not because I'm a snob. I do speak Portuguese. But I was married to a doctor in Brazil. And when I looked at all the medical books that she had, this section was the section in Portuguese. This section, whoops, wrong way, was the section in French. And my arms won't open up big enough to show the section in English because medical and scientific and technical books are not available in many other languages. So if a doctor is not able to read or speak or understand English, how much medical training have they actually had? Same with the scientist, same with the technician showing how important English is going to become for the future to make sure that people understand. In just a few years, 87% of globally-based jobs are going to require English. Um, many companies throughout the world already have proclaimed that English is the official language of the company. I look through the things here in Poland, and every day, every single programming, project management job, accounting, finance job, every single one of them requires advanced level of English. And that's here in Poland. Um, in the future, according to the documentary, 45% of today's jobs will be replaced by technology. Fortunately, that'll give me time to sleep because you can just put a robot here and he can talk for me. Now, you've often heard the argument fluency versus accuracy. Which do you think is more important? Type in the chat room. You can just put F or A. That's what I expected. Everybody says that fluency is more important. And I agree to a point. Now, fluency, if you're talking general English, yes, 
Fluency is the most important. If you're a waiter, if you're a clerk, if you're a taxi driver, a tourist, or just somebody who wants to speak the language generally, fluency is the key. And I work with this with general English students when I teach that. But think about it now. When I'm talking about a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, or somebody in business, what's more important is accuracy. Because if a doctor misdiagnoses or mis, um, miscommunicates, it could be a life or death situation. Think about a lawyer needs to understand the law in English when working internationally. Business people, the same. So we need to find that balance. When we're working with speaking, we're normally focused on meaning, context, and communication, and that's fluency. When we're working with writing, we tend to be focused on grammar, content, and correctness, and this is accuracy, and this is more important in business, but also speaking comes into this. So it's a matter of finding the balance, and um, this is a little cryptic. Oh, I spelt it wrong. Wait a minute. Let me add. Um, in order to, that they remain anonymous, I will not give out the name of the company, but I work with lawyers um, from this company, and we were working on um, an important email that was being sent from another country back to the United States regarding a tax situation. And the situation had a problem with one letter, the letter Y. Now, what was in the email said, our tax lawyers will handle all the calculations that were to be made. And reading on, I happened to notice that the law that they stated was a law that was not pertinent to that country, but to the other country. So I questioned the people that wrote this and said, are you sure you mean our tax lawyer and not your tax lawyer? And they said, no, it's not a typo, it's our tax lawyer. And when we discussed it a little further, it turned out that it should have been your tax lawyer. Because it wasn't, the taxes would not have gone through one of the laws, and because of this missing why, that oil company would have spent one billion dollars extra in taxes over a mistake of one letter so that's a very expensive letter now i was hoping to get at least a 10 percent reward for finding this but they just said thank you cheap oil companies anyway think about it how one letter can make a difference What a difference that this can make. A few people understand, few people understand. So we need accuracy, not just fluency. All right, to change a little bit, let's take a look at the workforce. It's typically a male and female, but what's our future workforce look like? Today's TikTok star. And this is what the future is coming to, and also... Because people don't have pensions and retirement funds anymore, we're looking at an aging workforce who doesn't speak English at all. This is why we're looking more at being replaced with machines. Because we don't have the level of English that's needed in the future of the workforce. So we need to help tomorrow's students now with what they're going to need for the future. So, perhaps what we should be teaching, I look at this that I know we do this in maybe in universities. I hope we do. I'm really not sure about Japan. I know the States. I know Poland. I know Russia. I know a lot of countries. Not sure of your reality there. But we need to work at a middle junior high school level and start teaching interviewing skills. 
13, 14, 15-year-olds. Now, in the United States, we get jobs at 16. I actually worked a little bit younger. Dennis, type in the chat room what year you started working. How old were you? We start working young in the States. So having interviewing skills and being confident, 16, same. Um, being confident at 16 to do an interview to get a job is difficult. We should be working with this from the time they turn into teenagers. Another thing, we need to teach them beginning negotiation skills. And I'm not talking about looking up at mommy and saying, please, can I stay up for another hour? No, we need to have them negotiate with teachers, with authority, with their friends. And we need to have them do this without fighting, but negotiating. We need to have them deal with conflict. And I'm not just talking about bullies. I'm talking about disagreeing and realizing how you can still be friends and disagree with conflict. We need to work on their business writing because I'll tell you, I work with professional business people now and their writing is horrible even if their speaking is at a C2 level. We need to work with collaboration skills and I know a lot of schools do this with different types of groups but a lot of schools that I know don't. We need to teach them how to work together into teams and start teaching management and leadership skills. Uh, presentation skills. I was amazed that here in Poland, um, I work with local university here teaching students how to give presentations. They're in university and they've never given a presentation. Never did it in high school never did it in junior high school, and haven't done it throughout university. They're going to have to give a presentation for their thesis, and they'll have to give presentations at work in the future. So we need to work on this now. Um, in the United States, it's great because we grow up with show and tell from the time we're little, and I think we do a much better job with presentation skills. I don't know if Japan does it, but um, I can tell you Brazilians um, in Russian schools, in Polish schools, they don't work with it at younger ages. Now, teachers are great at asking questions and eliciting answers from their students. But we're not great at teaching them how to ask questions. We need to reverse this and work on building questions and giving them the confidence to ask intelligent questions. I work with adults that, again, they're C2 level. They're going to conferences, they understand everything they hear, but they're afraid to ask a question because they don't want to look foolish. Or they don't want to look foolish sitting in a meeting with their peers and asking a question the wrong way. So we need to work with this on questioning skills. And just to give you a few quotes to allow me to drink. Okay, research. We need to tell, um, to work with them and get them to do research. How to work with big data, how to work with numbers, how to find the truth out of research that we read, where to look at it. And this goes along with discerning how to figure out if news is correct or not. You know, where do you go for your news sources? How do you go to multiple news sources to find out really what the truth is? Because we can't trust the news like we used to. And, uh, or <laughs> maybe we never could. But today we see it more and more. How to find answers. And I don't mean just Googling it. You know, there are different ways to get answers to things in life other than Google. You know, we did survive before Google existed. Surprisingly, I think we need to teach them how to use a dictionary. It's amazing. At least once a month, I'll get an email from somebody saying, teacher, what does this word mean? 
it took them longer to write the email to me than it did for them to look it up in a dictionary. And just teaching basic dictionary skills to kids today to let them know there's a source, very important. And even more important, the my favorite book in the world, other than the Bible, maybe, is Roger's Thesaurus. How to find synonyms for the words we use. I have a shortcut here because I do write books and I'm always looking for different words to replace. I use this as a learning tool. If you learn a new word, go to the thesaurus and learn five new ways to say that word. It's a great tool and it's free. Um, another great tool. Now, I'm not saying that you have to get rid of your accent or that people have bad pronunciation, but pronunciation can always be improved. Use YouTube. If you're, um, if you're, let's say, an American from Boston and you want to get rid of that Boston accent, then look for a neutral accent of somebody talking about teaching in English and listen to it. Work with it. It's free. Another free thing that we can teach these kids today is using Khan Academy, Udemy, Coursera as helpful tools to learn English. I had my accountant um, in Brazil. My company accountant was also my student. And, you know, she knows accounting. She's been a brilliant accountant. She's at the top of one of the big four accounting firms. And um, she knows accounting. She's learning English. She had general English, but she doesn't know how to put the two together. I had her take a basic accounting 101 class on Coursera, something that she knew how to do already, so she wasn't learning that, but she was hearing the language and being retaught in English for something that she already has skills at. And this is what I do with business people, using what they already know in some respect, I'm scaffolding of their prior knowledge of the business and teaching them English with it. Um, entrepreneurship, and I don't mean setting up a lemonade stand. Many schools have programs where they plan small businesses and they learn a little bit about business. Um, learning how to use professional graphics. Learning frameworks. These are decision-making frameworks. You may recognize this one, which is the SWOT analysis, which is one of the most basic analysis frameworks that you can use, but there's many more. So we should teach them how to work with these in the beginning because they're going to be working with them in the future in business. We need to teach them business applications. For instance, you see here things like Trello and Jira and, um, and Slack, which I use all the time. They're going to be using collaborative tools in the future. Now, maybe these will be outdated, but we need to teach them the basics so they know how to work with them now. And they can collaborate in their classes right now. Most people don't know how to use this until they're hired for a job. And if you look at job applications today, they're requiring knowledge of these programs. Processes. If you're working, um, Sarah, you're going to be a programmer. You've probably heard of Agile. You've probably heard of Scrum. You've probably heard of Kanban. Have you heard of them? Yes or no? A little. You will. So these are things that are used in all development teams having agile scrum meetings and using Kanban for planning. Now, again, these are important processes for the businesses of tomorrow. They're going to need these skills getting in there. Start working with them now. They're not that difficult. Graphics, teaching words. I'm amazed how um, even with C2 level executives, they say when they see a graph, it went up, it went down. Give them more words to work with. Work with finance. 
work with law. They need to know consumer rights, accounting, designing. They're going to be working with websites and social media. I know they know social media for dancing on TikTok, but they're going to need to work with this in respect to marketing products in business. Basically, what I'm looking to do is I try to build independent, autonomous students because they're going to be independent, autonomous users of the language when they're older. And the sooner we start with them, the better. Um, Help teach them self-value and their own worth. Teach them to work with rapport. They're going to need this later. Of course, emotional intelligence, diversity, and culture. Um, Culture is something we can start with right away. In 2013, I started a program where my students in Rio de Janeiro connected with students in Dusseldorf, Germany. And what they did is they were writing back and forth. They were sending videos back and forth. They were using uh, Facebook back then uh, when it was still cool as a kid. And they were doing intercultural exchange of information. But one thing that it made me realize is I think when we do these intercultural exchanges, we tend to focus in on the differences between us. And what I did is I changed the focuses that instead of the differences, let's talk about where we are the same. And I think going at it with this different attitude is better. So instead of working on how we're unlike and different, I think we should work how they are alike and the same. And perhaps that'll make a better world someday because we'll get them to like other cultures through understanding. And all this comes down to communicating, not by yelling and screaming as a typical teenager, but by whispering and talking to each other. So if I can leave you with one great idea and teach them to listen, not just hear, and teach them to communicate and not just speak. So with that, here's my information, and I would be happy to take any questions or comments or anything else. We've got some time left. Actually, we don't have many people, so if you'd like, you could open up your microphone and talk. Sarah, can they open their mics? Yeah, they can whenever they want. Great. Don't be shy. Hello, this is Dennis. Hi, Dennis. Rob, thank you very much. You've given me so much to think about. It's like my my brain is full now. (laughs) Oh, great. (laughs) Good. (laughs) I that hope it's full good, in a good way. That in a good way, yes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Great. Any comments or anything you can think of? Um, I well, your your approach to to business teaching business English, you know that, with in quotes, mm-hmm. and is is a lot more in, wider and encompasses a lot more than my idea was which i because i haven't done much of it Mm -hmm. even though i've been teaching about 16 years in uh, english conversation Mm -hmm. and i've actually taught toic prep um, Mm one-on-one which joy but teaching business english i a few times i did it it, i yeah it wasn't really comfortable because uh, as you stated in the beginning i wasn't really sure how to approach it yeah Well, this is one of the problems. We have to decide, are you teaching English in a business or are you teaching business through English? And I think so many teachers, you know, they pick up like a copy of Market Leader or something like that and think, okay, now I'm a business English teacher. There's much more to it. Um, (laughs) Sure. And, you know, it's, it's amazing how, you know, having a business background for me, of course, made it much easier. And um, because, you know, I have experience I can, you know, draw on every day. 
And um, I can understand if you don't have a business background, how difficult it can be. I remember in university a hundred years ago, I had a uh, microeconomics teacher who was about 70 years old, who graduated university um, and used the same book <laughs> to teach that he used a hundred years before that. And it taught me absolutely nothing. He had no experience and he was teaching uh. things from the 1900s. Not Ouch. applicable. You know, think about it today. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess that you're you're over 30, <laughs> probably over yeah, 40, yeah, right? Yeah. All should right. I, should, so, I, uh, should I show my face? Let me sure, you can. Feel I'm, free. I'm a novice at this, this video stuff. <laughs> I have no idea. Matthew, if I'm feel free to. Too. You can turn on. It's the the camera at the bottom. Okay. All right, there yeah, you are. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, so, so you're about 25. Okay. I can tell. <laughs> Thanks um, for that. <laughs> you're welcome. You owe me. Well, the camera. <laughs> yeah. Good. So, um, you know, what we were taught when we were young, half of that I don't think is appropriate anymore. And, you're right you know, about if that. You, yeah. It, if you look at it, you know, like the periodic table, sure. If you're going into science, you need that. But if I needed it, I can Google it. Why exactly. do we waste so much time on things like that? They say it's to become a well-rounded student. Ah, bull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're right. And I have a liberal arts background in education, so I, and I agree with you on that one. Mm -hmm. Specialization <laughs> is where it's at, actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Matthew's having his second vaccine. Okay. Well, feel free. You can also type. Um, I've been through it. I hope everybody's healthy and vaccinated. Um, I didn't wear a mask today, but I have Norton antivirus running, so I'm not worried about it. <laughs> good. And Great. I've had two shots. I just got my second shot, so. Oh, good. Good. No Norton necessary for me, but okay. Nice. <laughs> and, well, you know, the the big thing is um, you, you get some training. If you're looking to do business mm -hmm. English, get some training. It's yes. not that yeah. difficult. And, you know, one thing that we have with the BSIG is we've got membership all over the world. And we share, we collaborate all the time with members. So it's a good source of information. And there's that some good, good courses yeah. out there. That, that's yeah, definitely take, something I'm going to look into, Rob. Very good. Yeah, yeah, take a look. Here, I'll put it in the chat room. It's really easy to remember. And we do do um, things for free. Um, and some of the stuff we do, we charge for. It, for it's for membership uh, to Aya Tefl. And, you know, this is great if you're, if you're going to do anything. I know JALT um, in Japan has the BizCom. Um, mm. They're associate members of the BSIG. So I know the guys well, over good. there, too. That, that's my plan in early next year to, to move to Japan, where I taught English before. Um, so I'm working oh, on nice. that now. But, great. Uh, Sarah will help you out when you get there, right, Sarah? <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Great. Sarah, are you part of BizCom? I'm not, but I've been to a meeting before, and I know some of the people leading it. Oh, great. Very good. Yeah. I'm in the well, vocabulary site, though. Yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. Well, we have, I guess, about a minute left then, right? Two minutes? All right. Any other questions or comments, Dennis or Sarah? Matthew, you can type. Um, oh, about Poland. Um, you, I, I assume that's the house behind you, your house? <laughs> You'll never I, know. I never know. I know. I shouldn't be asking that question. <laughs> but the reason is, this is totally unrelated, but I just saw online um, uh, uh, a modern style house built in the pole polish uh, farmland somewhere and 
traditional uh, shape, but interior very modern. And I was really taken with it. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. high roof and yeah. open interior and yeah. um, a central fireplace. And mm-hmm. it looked great. And I was telling my wife yeah. and saying, that's our house. The next house, we're going to build that one. It's actually the next one I want to build, too. It's, um, you know, I'm used to the American architecture. I lived in Orlando, too, for years. And, you know, Uh the huge open spaces. And it's nice. So the next house will have huge high ceilings with floating lofts for the office to work at home. Floating lofts. That's a good idea. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but as a timer says, that's at 5.30. Um, if you want to continue the conversation, the social rooms are open. Mm-hmm. So you can just move over there. So wanted to say thank you for your great presentation. And Thanks I'm going to stop recording me. now. All right, great. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Dennis. 